Okay, uh, hello. Uh, I'm Petr Blaho and this is Jirka Stransky. Uh, we are happy to uh, talk here uh, about uh, designing HTM HTTP RESTful APIs. Uh, we work at Red Hat on iOS project. Some of you who uh, was there <coughs> on the last presentation uh, won't uh, uh, know what, what iOS is. Uh, we were building uh, API and command line tool for Aeolus. So uh, we will talk uh, today about some uh, key REST principles. So you will uh, learn uh, what, the, what REST is and what it is useful for. And uh, in the next part, uh, we will talk about some practical issues uh, we encountered when designing uh, API. And uh, if we will have enough time, we will have some uh, question and answer section. I will now pass the word for uh, Virka, and he will start with that uh, interesting things. Thanks. So HTTP RESTful APIs. Um, why are they useful? What are they good for? Um, and in the beginning, why should we care about them? Well, I think we should care about them because they are so popular. Uh, when you're choosing a technology for, for your API, you don't have as much free choice uh, as when you're using, uh, for example, uh, when you're choosing a programming language. Uh, for example, GitHub, Twitter, uh, OpenStack, they use uh, RESTful APIs, so if you want to, if you want to use uh, their APIs, if you want to communicate with them, you have to use RESTful API. On the other side, when you uh, are producing an API, you always have to think about uh, who will use that API and uh, you want to make it as accessible for them as possible. So chances are uh, whether you are going to consume or produce an API, it's gonna be a RESTful API. Why are they so popular? I think it's because they are easy to consume. Uh, REST, HTTP REST gives you a sort of a set of conventions uh, that when you learn them, they feel like a shared language. And uh, then when you know that language, you can consume different APIs and it still feels somehow familiar. So HTTP and REST, two concepts, different but very uh, interrelated. We will take a look at REST first. REST stands for uh, Representational State Transfer, and it's an architectural style for communicating between uh, remote applications or systems. Unlike HTTP, REST is not a standard. It's not something that you could implement according to some specification. It's more like a set of um, conventions or rules. Here are the key rules of REST, not all of them, but the key ones. It's a client-server paradigm, which means uh, the clients don't communicate with, with each other. They always communicate through a server or with, with the server only. It's a stateless paradigm, which means that the server doesn't have to um, remember the whole communication with the client. It doesn't have to maintain the connection. Each request has to contain enough information for the server so that it's able to fulfill the request and return the response. The key concept of REST are resources. Uh, I will talk about them in a, in a while. And those resources uh, have to have a uniform interface on them. Uh, you have to always treat your resources in the same way. That's what REST says. It doesn't say what that way is, but it, sa it says that the way has to be always the same. Uh, HTTP comes here uh, and for, uh, gives the uniform interface. It says what the uniform interface is. About HTTP, I will talk further on. Uh, key uh, unit of exchange with REST uh, APIs is so-called resource representation. I will talk about it as well. Uh, so, what's a resource? Resource is any information that can be somehow named, uh, somehow distinguished from the rest of the information that we have. 
A resource can be mutable, it can change its state in time, but it maintains an identity throughout its lifespan. Identity that doesn't change. It's, uh, the, the identity is expressed by a unique URL where you can access the resource. Two main types that of resources that you will see are collections, for example, all users of my application, and elements, this particular user named Bob, for example. Here are some examples of the resource URLs, how they look like. So the first two ones would be, uh, would be collection URLs, uh, user of my application, books that uh, I have in my application. And the, second, the next two ones would be uh, element URLs, particular user and particular book. Uh, and the third one is there to uh, somehow show that the collections and uh, elements can be nested. That would be user's collection, in that user's collection a particular user, and with that user a collection of books, for example, that he has read or he owns. So resource representations. Uh, resource representations are snapshots of a resource state serialized into some format. Uh, they are interesting uh, that they ha uh, have hyperlinks in them so that uh, when you fetch a resource, uh, you will get usually a lot of links to other resources. And this way you can just travel through the uh, API and uh, discover all the resources and fetch them. So uh, re resource representations, uh, th there can be many resource representations for one resource because you have uh, different media types, for example, or different formats, XML and JSON, for example. And um, yeah, so uh, let's, look at, let's look at them. This is a representation of the same resource, two resource representations. Uh, it's very simple. It's just a user that has a name, nothing more. The upper one is XML, the, the lower one is JSON. Uh, they uh, have only hyperlink to themselves, which uh, is useful, for example, when you fetch the resource, you wanna know uh, if you want to update it, you wanna know where uh, would the request go. So it's always useful to link not only other resources, but, but also itself. So that was just a brief introduction to REST, to resources and resource represent representations. So let's take a look at HTTP now. HTTP is a, is a protocol that you can implement, as I, as I said earlier. Uh, with REST, it's important because it provides the uniform interface for us. As I said, REST doesn't say, REST says it has to be uniform inter interface. It doesn't say what the interface looks like. HTTP does. Uh, the uniform interface consists of two uh, main fundamental parts uh, of response codes and request methods mainly. So let's take a look at response codes first. Uh, they are useful for telling how your request went. Was it a success? Was it a failure? Maybe some detail why it was a failure. Uh, so success versus error is the main use. There are a lot of them. We don't have enough time to go through all of them. We don't have enough time to go through the important ones that you will have to know when you're implementing the REST API. But I will at least uh, show the most common ones that you will en encounter to some somehow give you an idea of uh, what sort of information the response codes carry. With success codes, it's okay. Yeah, I should uh, say, Every, every uh, response code has two parts to it, always a number and a name, probably for uh, easier parsing. So uh, OK code says it, the action was a success, doesn't give, enough uh, doesn't give uh, additional information. Uh, created code says the request uh, was a success and uh, create a resource, a new resource was created while uh, processing the request. No content says the, the request was a success and I don't have any information additional uh, that I could send to you. 
the, the response would uh, contain no body in that case. Client error codes, some, some of the interesting ones. Uh, unauthorized means that uh, the request that you sent could not be fu fulfilled because uh, you didn't have um, enough rights for the request. But if you resubmit the request and provide some credentials for it, um, username and password, for example, the request might be f fulfilled. You might have enough, uh, enough uh, rights. So it basically says resubmit the request and send uh, credentials with it. Forbidden says you don't, uh, have just, uh, you don't have the right to do it. Resubmitting won't help. Uh, not found, we all probably know it uh, from browsing the web. It says that the, the, the resource that we wanted simply is not there, doesn't exist. And unprocessable entity is useful when you want to create or, or update a resource and you send data that is invalid, that uh, the server can't make sense of it or there's some field missing, for example then the server will give you uh, 422. Some services use different codes, but I think this last one is becoming more used in, in the last years. And two interesting server error codes, 500 internal server error for just when the server blows up uh, with, uh, for example, uh, unhandled exception, and service unavailable for uh, when the server is overloaded or in maintenance mode. You might have seen this one on Twitter, for example. So now to HTTP request methods. They are mainly used for doing CRUD operations, uh, which means uh, the CRUD stands for create, read, update, delete. You can use, it, use them for more, but uh, CRUD is the most common way. If you can model the situation uh, that you can use CRUD, you probably should because it's sort of a, a convention again. I will talk about six of the HTTP methods. Uh, the four that are listed separately are uh, for mani manipulating the resources, for doing the CRUD operations, and the last two are for, for introspection into the API when you want to get some extra information, not uh, necessarily uh, manipulate the resources, but get some information about the API. So, POST. You will use POST method mainly for creating a resource. Here's an example. So, on the first line, uh, we can see that we're issuing a POST request to the user's URL, which is a collection. And uh, then there are HTTP headers. Uh, usually in both uh, request and uh, mainly in response, there are more headers than that, but I omitted them so that we, can, we could fit it on the slide. Uh, except says, uh, when you return a response, I want, that, I want XML to be the body of the response. Content type says, I'm sending you a request that the body of the request is an XML. And then there's the resource representation that we are trying to create. So we are trying to create a user named Alice Adams. And we get back uh, 201 created. That's the status code I was talking about previously. And we get a location header that says where the resource is, the, the resource that we created. And we get a representation of the resource that we created. It's the same as, as uh, the one we sent with the exception that now there's uh, an, a hypertext reference assigned to it. Get. Get is used for retrieving representations of, of a resource, for basically doing the read operation. Uh, you can use URL parameters with get, uh, which is useful for, for example, listing, uh, when listing collections, you can filter them or perform a full text search, for example. You can also cache uh, get, uh, which is uh, useful if you want to provide a public API and want to save, your some, sa save you some uh, load on the server. We're not going to go deep into caching. So get 
uh, on a on a element URL. We're getting the user that we cr created, Alice Adams. We again say that we want uh, XML as as uh, the result, and we're getting OK and the representation of the resource. If it contains some hyperlinks, we could traverse them and, and get some other resources. Uh, here is an example of get on collection. Again, we, we get on the uh, user's collection URL, and we get a whole collection of users. Some APIs uh, don't list the full representations of the element URLs in the listings, but just uh, links. You know, here's, here's the collection, these are the links to the URLs, uh, links to the resources, and if you want to know more details about them, you have to fetch them. Uh, with ALS, we use this, this uh, type of providing more information on, on the listings as well. And last example for, the, for GET, uh, we again query the user's collection, but now we uh, supply a parameter to it, a query parameter that performs full text search, and we are saying that we want just those users that contain the string Alice. So we get again a users listing with uh, Alice Adams in it, only Alice Adams. Put is used for the update operation mainly, uh, but you can use it for create as well if you know uh, what the target URL of that newly created resource should be. So uh, you can't use it for uh, auto-incremented URLs, as, a, as I showed previously, two, three, and, and so on. But if you have some unique URL, like uh, hash, for example, or, uh, or some U, UID or, or ISBN for books, then you could put directly to that URL and create a resource. So here's an example how you would use put for updating. We're putting on the Alice Adams URL, and uh, we're saying uh, we want to rename her to Kristin Cooper. We're getting back uh, OK, and uh, again, the resource representation updated. Here's how you could use put for creating a resource. We know that the URL, uh, we know that the ISBN is for that book, so it won't collide with any other book. So we can put directly uh, on the on the uh, element resource instead of putting on the collect uh, instead of posting on the collection, and we get 201 created to indicate that the resource was created, and again the re representation. Delete is very simple; it's just for deleting. So uh, we can delete uh, Christine Cooper this way. We issue a delete request on on a, on its URL and we get 200 no content, 204 no con content, which means the request was successful, the user is deleted, and I don't have any data, data, any resource representation to give you back. Head request, that's the first of the introspection uh, methods, is uh, used, for example, when you want uh, to check the state of your cache and not fetch, uh, fetch the data or just check whether when, when some resource exists or not. So uh, it's like get, but it uh, doesn't uh, send you the resource representation. The, the content body is omitted. The meta information has to stay the same. So with head, we will get 200 OK, even, then, even when the response doesn't contain any data. Uh, there are some. Uh, Header examples that you might use for uh, for updating your cache, for example, or uh, just telling uh, whether it's uh, up to date or not. So options, uh, the last method type I want to talk about. Uh, when you're not sure what what methods are supported for some some resource for some URL, you can issue an options request to the URL, and uh, you will get back. Um, usually uh, 204 no content and with a allow header that will list you all the requests, uh, all, all the method uh, types that you can issue on that URL. Okay, uh, short stop uh, at the method properties. Uh, get, head, and options request are set to be safe, which means 
they must not change the state of the application. This is excellent for crawling the APIs, or for example, for crawling the uh, World Wide Web, uh, because it says, I can issue a GET request, that, which means fetching a representation of a resource on anything, and it can't break anything. It can't change state of the application. Uh, put and delete requests are idempotent, which means that it changes the state of the application, or if it's implemented right, the, the, the application, it changes the state only the first time you submit it. Uh, like we changed the name of, of Alice Adams into Christine Cooper, uh, when we submit the request for the first time, it changes the name. When we submit for the second time, the state remains the same. Delete requests share that, share that property as well. So what's important to take from this is that you must not use get request for changing the state of your application. Some people, for example, implement uh, polls on their websites and they use uh, get request URLs uh, or uh, they use get requests for uh, voting in the polls, and then it happens that crawlers and and uh, search engines vote in their vote in their um, polls because they expect that get is safe and then they cannot do any harm when they crawl get uh, crawl URLs with get requests. So this is just an overview of what I talked about. Uh, basically, that for collection. Uh, you mostly use post for creating uh, subordinate elements in the collection. You use get for listing the collection, and if you supply some query parameters, you uh, also can filter the collection. And for elements, you mostly use uh, get for reading details about that element, uh, put for updating, or sometimes for creating, and delete for deleting. Yeah, in the beginning, I talked about uh, REST APIs being easy to consume, uh, having some, some conventions. Uh, so let's take a look at a few examples. Uh, these examples all perform some kind of search on, on APIs. And these APIs are three absolutely different ones. The first API is uh, API of GitHub, and it searches for, for GitHub issues with uh, labeled with enhancement. The second uh, URL uh, does a search on Google Plus activities that are labeled, uh, that, that contain the word DEF CON. And the third UR, uh, URL does a search in tweets that uh, contain DEF CON. So even though these are three different services, you have a feeling that there's some uh, common way to treat them, some common way to access them. There's always a collection URL and then some parameters. And this is how you basically do searches on all REST APIs. So I would like to invite Peter to talk about issues with REST APIs, that the world is not always that, uh, that green. Thank you. I think so. Yeah, I would say so. And also, I was uh, bothered by your using absolute URLs within the content of the response. Because if you are behind the proxy, which rewrites the URLs, and it will know that it should rewrite the location, for example, after create, it will not know how to modify the content of the response. So is it really correct to hard code Full absolute URLs into, into the response. Yeah, I was I was mainly thinking about uh, perspective of the, of the client, which should get an absolute uh, URL. Well, the client knows what URL it used to create, and if you want to reference something else, you can always use relative URLs or relative paths. Well, but uh, the client should uh, get always absolute URL because. The URL that clients work with are supposed to be unique for each resource all over the world. Okay, uh, so when you get a relative URL, 
it's it's not it's not a unique URL uh, identifying that only one resource. You might have uh, instance of the same, same application uh, run on a different uh, server and uh, with different data, and these two would be different uh, different resources then, and it wouldn't identify the uh, resource uniquely. But uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, we should take questions on at the end because I'm just a bit worried that Petr will not uh, have time to say uh, his part. So, uh, But uh, we can definitely discuss this further. Okay, thank you, Vika. So uh, when we were uh, working uh, and designing uh, RESTful API for IOLUS, uh, we encountered some issues. And I would like to uh, talk about something uh, you can encounter too. One of the first thing you uh, can encounter is uh, if your API is backwards compatible or not. Uh, that, uh, of course, could be uh, problematic because no one wants that uh, clients for uh, your application uh, break. So what can, what can change or what cannot change to be backwards compatible? We have a resource representation uh, which means that you can add new things, uh, probably new uh, new data attributes for your resource representation. It's okay because client usually should uh, ignore something which uh, it doesn't uh, know. If you just add new uh, resource representation, maybe you will be exporting your user profile into PDF or JPEG or whatever. Uh, that's Okay, too, because client do not know about new thing, and if uh, it doesn't know how to work with it, it should, ju it should just ignore it. Other thing is when you want to remove or change something, because uh, client will broke. So uh, this is the problem, and uh, you should avoid it at all. Um, Another thing uh, which can change are URLs of your resources, which is problematic because as Jirka uh, just a minute ago said that uh, your URL should uh, be unique and in fact uh, it should not change during uh, lifetime of your resource. So a client uh, know uh, where to find that resource. When you will uh, develop your API or your application as a whole, you will find that uh, you need some versioning thing because uh, you will be backwards incompatible at some uh, point of your uh, application uh, developing. And uh, there are two, two ways how to uh, make versioning in RESTful API easy. One is using uh, URLs, maybe namespacing uh, bit, uh, before, uh, for example, collection uh, foo URL. This is the way most uh, biggest uh, public facing APIs uh, use, uh, GitHub, for example. Other thing, uh, you can use parameter uh, that from my point of view, doesn't look so well, so I would not use it, but it's not forbidden. Uh, the question you should ask is uh, whether um, version net uh, resources are really the same resource, because uh, if you will answer yes, so they should not have uh, two different URLs pointing at them. You can also uh, think in terms that uh, two versions of your applications are in fact different applications and uh, that's uh, probably different resources even uh, they contain some da data. You can use media type too for versioning. Uh, for example, you can embed your version uh, directly into media type, uh, so you will use your custom vendor media type uh, I'm not really sure if you can see it. Uh, there's a V2.0 uh, in media type. This way uh, lets the URLs be the same for each version. So you can just uh, 
think about versioning of your uh, resources or your API like just you have another, another uh, representation of your resource. You can of course use uh, parameters in uh, media type which uh, from my point of view is clearer than the before. Another issue you can find uh, is uh, how much your application or your API should be auto-discoverable. Uh, it's uh, in fact one of the great thing of REST because there are uh, some conventions. You have uniform interface here Kato told about. So uh, this is uh, this is this, these simple actions which translate to create, create, read, update, and delete. Uh, uh, so you can work with your, uh, with your resources easily. And uh, everyone just needs a URL where your resource is and knows how to work with it. HTOAS, uh, which states for hypermedia as the engine of application state, uh, is uh, is that hyperlinks you just see in uh, that example Sirka, Sirka uh, shows. In fact, just simple HTML and browsing with your web browser is using hypermedia because you just use URLs you find on your document, on your resource representation, which is uh, every page you just uh, see. So this, uh, you only need four HTOS entry points, which is some uh, resource or document which just points to every, uh, every kind of resource you have in your application. And then you just follow hypermedia links. Uh, there are, in fact, two groups of uh, developers. Uh, one say that uh, server uh, which provides API should not tell the client uh, what to do next and the client should choose uh, its own way, its own workflow with resources. Other uh, which fits this HTOS thing is that uh, it works like that HTML uh, page and browsing that with each resource you just get a set of links, set of URLs which can be followed like uh, embedded resources, uh, some other things you can do with the resource, some related resources, and so on. So it's only up to you how you uh, choose it. It's not mandatory. OK, uh, if you will be building something more uh, complicated than block, uh, you will probably uh, have in your application long running actions, which uh, can uh, bring some kind of issues. For example, if you just uh, want to create resource and uh, creating that resource takes some seconds, 10 seconds, minutes, you will have blocking request for your server, which is wrong, that connection will be opened and that client will be waiting and waiting and waiting. You can solve it by creating jobs. So you will just create new resource on your, uh, on your server, which uh, is a job, and that's all. Connection will be closed, uh, and client has to find out if uh, that job is completed or not. How it will find? It can poll for results. Uh, that's uh, probably sometimes you will use this way. Just ask uh, server, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And so on and server will keep asking no, 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 and finally they will ask yes, we are just created that resource or finished the job. You can uh, use hooks. Uh, who of you use GitHub and probably some other kind of web applications? You can just set up hooks when your repository changes. GitHub makes HTTP request for URL you provided and uh, this is hook. So uh, that's the other uh, way of how to find out if job is complete. One problem is this when you are uh, end user client and 
you are uh, behind firewall or whatever, so you are just not, you, can, you cannot receive your hook. So this is uh, mainly for server-to-server uh, -server communication. Many-to-many -many relationships. Uh, it uh, seems easy, but you have to uh, think about subcollections because you just have subcollections sub in REST and if you want many-to-many -many relationship implemented somehow, you just have to ask if is it really a resource. Because uh, sometimes you just need to expose more data in that uh, connection. Uh, for example, uh, if you just take post and uh, tags in blog post, in, in blog application, so you just want to uh, expose data about when that tag on that post was created or so. So in that case, it's really resource. And you, ju you, ju you just can use subcollections on both of it. So every tag should have posts which uh, are tagged with that tag, and every post should have tags which are uh, with this post. If you will find that uh, your many-to-many -many relationship isn't resource, you can just use the put-delete uh, actions on some URL. It's not really RESTful. Uh, it's not clear, but it works it's easy. For example, GitHub uses it to, uh, to set a user, GitHub user, as a member of team. You can just found uh, in their documentation how they use it. Jirka uh, was talking about some searching uh, in collections. Uh, that's another thing you will encounter because uh, when you have uh, thousands and thousands of records, you just cannot uh, return uh, a few megabytes in, in response. So we will just need pagination, ordering, and filtering. The same question as before, is it the same resource? Is it really the same resource? Because uh, when you just uh, bring to your heart that uh, resource have unique URL, so using something like this points to another resource. It's not wrong, it's uh, just a way of how to think about uh, your ordering or paginating or whatever. You can of course use uh, URL queries and uh, you can use media type too for this kind of uh, requests. When you will be building API, you will probably have some UI of your application, especially in web applications. And uh, there's two things how you can uh, come to this problem, how you can uh, work with it. You can have API and UI as a separate applications uh, working on the same backend. So there will be just some applications not exposed to, uh, to end user or to public and UI and API will be separate applications. This thing has, uh, this way can lead to some uh, code duplication uh, because probably you will need the same behavior in your API application and in your application with, uh, for example, HTML UI. Another way is use uh, or think of UI application as a client of your API so we will just build API application and you or somebody other uh, will be uh, creating UI on top of your API. Uh, for example, you can create a rich JavaScript application uh, just as JavaScript client for your API. This is, of course, issues if you want application uh, that works without JavaScript, so you will have uh, need some server side for, for that UI. So we are in the questions and answers uh, part of this talk. So do you have any questions? Yes? Yeah. 
Okay. Yes. Yeah, the, uh, the question was uh, if it's uh, if it's really needed uh, uh, to transfer all the data during, uh, for example, query for a list of resources. Uh, I think we can find the slide uh, because. Uh, uh, you can uh, use a URL parameter for that uh, again. You can, or <clears throat> maybe uh, again, a media, media type parameter uh, that you will say that you don't want full resources in the listing, that you want just uh, links. And it will, it will give you the minimal description of the resource, just uh, saying user and uh, hypertext reference equals and, and some, some URL, and you will have uh, just a list. So, so it's only up to uh, the developers of the server side think you can uh, probably think of this. If you, if you imagine that these users have uh, more data, so this is kind of brief list with uh, something to identify for end user like a name and something to identify uh, yeah, like a URL for the client. Yes? I'm not really sure if I heard everything. Yeah, you asked, so uh, the you question was how, I, how are uh, conflicts handled? And uh, you can, uh, well, first, uh, of, uh, first type of conflict handling, of course, is to ignore it. Uh, uh, but you can, uh, you can send an e-tag uh, HTTP header with, with each uh, resource. Uh, as in, in uh, responses when you when you answer for get request, and you can require uh, the client to well first what is an e tag header? E tag header uh, is again some sort of unique identifier not of the resource but of the state. Uh, it can be some hash or, or uh, for something like this, and you can uh, require that. Uh, client <coughs> uh, who wants to update the resource to send uh, the header. I don't. I don't know if it's called etag when you send it. <coughs> send it in a request. Maybe it's something else. But you can uh, definitely uh, send it with the request. And if uh, the etag that the client uh, has sent uh, doesn't match the etag that is currently in your database, that means that. Uh, between he fetched the resource and tried to update it, someone else updated it already. And you can uh, send, uh, there's, a, there's a response status for that. I didn't, I didn't list it uh, in the brief, brief lists. Uh, I think it's 410 conflict or, or something, and, and that, that solves it, basically. Yeah, you're saying uh, fetch it again and then update it. Put really intended to be a replace resource, not update. And the uh, fetch is basically what you use for updating the resource. Yes, yes, it is. Yes. Uh, I had it in my slides, but then I uh, removed it uh, because uh, of time uh, issues. Question. Uh, question. Yeah, question, sorry. Uh, question was a, if put isn't really meant to replace, not update the resource. Uh, in fact, put uh, should. Uh, just take the resource in the form as submitted to the server and just uh, save it. Uh, there is a proposal for HTTP 2.0, I think, if I'm it's correct. Already one on one. It's already in one-on-one -on -one for a patch uh, method which just um, takes the attributes or data submitted in the request and just only this uh, kind of data will be updated for that uh, resource. Yeah. So. Uh, so yeah, that, that was a good point. Uh, when you want to update just some, um, some uh, attributes of the resource, you can use patch request. Um, you said it's part of HTTP 1.1. I think it's not, but <laughs> uh, we, we would have to. Stick my hand to fire for that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you could use a patch request uh, for that and just 
uh, list the attributes that you want uh, updated. And with put requests, you should always send the whole representation of the resource. That's how HTTP uh, describes it. Okay, uh, we are out of the time, so uh, thank you very much for listening. And if you have any other questions, come down and we will discuss it. Yeah. Thank you.